Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. Around uh, 100 AD, all of the apostles except John had been killed on account of their testimony about Jesus. John was the only one left, and he was exiled to an island in the Mediterranean Sea. On a Sunday, God appeared to him and gave him a vision, and that vision is the book of Revelation. Chapters 21 and 22 are the final scene. So we'll listen again to the first seven verses of the second to last chapter of the Bible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is the word of our Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, earlier in the book of Revelation, there's a a section where God gives John a vision of, of heaven that's similar to this one. In that scene, John sees a a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language. And, And John's heavenly tour guide, one of the things he tells him is, God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I used to wonder, why would God wipe away tears in heaven? Nobody's going to cry there. I get it now. He's not talking about tears that will shed up there. He's talking about every tear that we shed down here. As your pastor, I've seen more than a few of you cry. But that doesn't make me an expert in everything that makes you sad or scared. Nobody's seen all of your tears except you alone. And there's... There's so many different kinds of tears, aren't there? Tears from loss, from guilt, from loneliness, from betrayal, from addiction, from the realization that you can't go back in time and change what you did or undo what somebody else did to you. Sometimes they may just float on your cheeks like a waterfall, Other times, you may wish that you could just let it all out and be happy again, but the tears just don't come. So so I'm not going to pretend to know all your tears. But I tell you that God knows them. He's keeping track so that when the day comes, he can be sure to wipe every single one of them away for good. Let's take a walk through heaven this morning. It's, it's good to keep our eyes on what's coming. In, in, in this passage, God shows us what's waiting for us on the other side of the finish line in order to give us the strength to keep on going until we cross it. So you think about, about John the Apostle, how badly he needed strength when God showed him this, this vision. We're at, like I said before, about 100 A.D., It's been about 70 years since John last saw Jesus and he saw him ascending up into heaven with his hands raised to bless him. But in the meantime, 
that blessing seems to have faded. Uh, the, the crop of congregations, Christian congregations, that had cropped up around the Mediterranean world in those early years, many of them were withering. Some of it on account of, of persecution from the outside, some of it from self-destruction from the inside. And then you think about all the, the apostles that, that John had followed together with Jesus. Peter, James, Paul, and all the others. All of them killed on account of Jesus. Now it's just John left. And John, is, he's stuck on the Roman version of Alcatraz, exiled to a rock of an island in the Mediterranean Sea. Yeah, he hasn't died for Jesus, but maybe, maybe being locked up is even worse. The Christian church seems to be crumbling all around him, and all he can do is watch. Here's the twist, though. On a Sunday, God comes to, an, to him in a vision, and God says to John, all I want you to do is watch. Watch what I show you and write it down. And what John saw and wrote down that's the book of Revelation. It's, the book consists of basically scene after scene of attacks against the Christian church, all kinds of different attacks. Some of it, again, persecution from the outside, other moral and doctrinal decay on the inside. But at the end of every single one of those scenes, when the dust settles, the church is still standing. Now in the last two chapters of Revelation 21 and 22, the very last chapters of the Bible. This is where God shows John what's on the other side of the finish line. He says, write this down because you're not the only one that needs it. He gives John a vision of what's coming in order to give him and us the, the strength to keep on going until we get there. It's heaven. So, what's it going to look like? How old are our bodies going to look? What are we going to spend our time doing there? When it comes to the, the details of where we're going to spend eternity, God really doesn't give us too much. In this passage, it's, it's really just the, the very first verse. On the last day, the, the universe as we know it will pass away and God will create a new heaven and, and a new earth. Everything that's, that's now broken and corrupted by sin will be restored to perfection. And yeah, that's about it as far as details go. Look for this when you read your Bible. When God talks about heaven, there's a lot less of a focus on what it's going to look like and a whole lot more focus on who's going to be there. And that's what it is, that's what it is here too. So John looks up from the, the, the new heaven and earth and he sees the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from the sky into it. And don't think, uh, don't think buildings as in, as in streets and, don't think city as in streets and buildings. This is, this is city as in people. So he sees this beautiful bunch of people as flawless and sinless and perfect as the world that it's setting down into. What he's describing here is a wedding. A city full of people. How does he put it? prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. She's arriving for the ceremony. So where there's a wedding, there's the, there's the bride, but you need a groom. Where's the groom? The groom is the groom's already there waiting for the bride. The, the groom is God. So John, here's this loud voice. A loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, 
and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. So we have this description of heaven that's it's kind of light on geography and its, and its decorations so that we can focus on the inhabitants. It's a bride and, and her groom on their wedding day. The honeymoon's never going to be over. She's never going to leave him. He's never going to let her down. He'll wipe away every tear from her eyes and she'll never have reason to cry again. Can you understand why this is what John needed to see? So that when he looks around on earth and all he sees is is the churches withering and, and wickedness winning, so that he can know that it's not going to be like this forever. The new heaven and the new earth that that he sees right now in the future will one day be the present reality. And God makes it clear that that this isn't wishful thinking. This is 100% certainty. God says this part, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. It's like God is cheering on the marathon runner at the beginning of the 26th mile. Keep pressing on with your eyes on the prize. But that's not the only reason why John needed to see this. It wasn't only so that he could keep his focus on the future. What John saw also opened up his eyes to the present. The Alpha and the Omega God calls himself. The beginning and the end. That is, the the Lord Almighty who, who created all things and controls all things. He's not just waiting on the other side of the finish line. He pictures it like like a bride and a groom, like a father and his son. He pictures that happening in the new heaven and the new earth. And he says things like, like, they will be my people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. But he's not just talking about the future. Sure, that that bride and groom and father, son, and God and people relationship, that'll enter into a new and final phase in heaven. But it's still not just the future. It's the present. The inhabitants of heaven, their relationship is already that way now. Maybe think of all the things that that make you cry. Or maybe all the things that, that you wish you could just let out and let the tears wash it away, but the tears just won't come. Is it something like, like guilt or addiction? And when you look at yourself in the mirror, you don't see a beautiful bride. In fact, Maybe you wonder how God could love you when you can't even stand yourself. But God doesn't just say that you will be his bride in heaven. He says you are right now. Ever since your baptism, when God washed your sins away, and clothed you with Jesus' forgiveness. He's called you, and I'm quoting here, he's called you his radiant bride without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. You may look at yourself and be disappointed and, and think about all the things that you need to do before God will love you, 
but when God looks at you right now, that's not what he sees. He sees you clothed in Jesus' forgiveness. Like a beautiful bride, you're perfect to him. Or the things that, that cause you to cry. Maybe it's something more like loneliness. You spend most of your days by yourself. Or maybe you're surrounded by people all day long, but it's like nobody really knows you or understands you, so they might as well be a million miles away. But God doesn't just say that you, that you will be his son in heaven. Every time you pray, our Father, he's reminding you that that's what you are right now and that he's proud to call you his. And God loves you and he knows you no less than he loves and knows Jesus because it's Jesus' blood that brought you into the family. So even if you don't have a friend in the world and, and, and nobody cares about you, you have a father. The things that make you cry, maybe it's more like anxiety. And you're always coming up in your, in your mind of all the things that could possibly go wrong. Or, or maybe, you're, maybe it's reality and you're looking right now in your life at all the things that have gone wrong. And it seems like God is just letting everything spiral out of control and, and you're caught up in the storm. But God doesn't just say, that he's God. He says he's your God. Your God, your very own. And he's already saying right now what you'll see in heaven. It's one of his favorite statements in the Bible. Already right now he's saying, I am with you. He doesn't just tell you, oh, I'm waiting for you on the other side of the finish line. Good luck until you get there. I am with you. You're my bride. I'm your groom. You're my child. I'm your father. I will not leave you. I forgive you. I love you. I treasure you. I'm with you. What John sees, it's not just about what's coming. It's about what's now. That doesn't take away all the tears. Not yet. Doesn't make the marathon any shorter. Instead, it shows you where your strength is. Not in yourself, but in your God. And then, when the day comes and God carries his church over the finish line and you're there and you see that, that great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language, you're not just going to be some faceless person in the crowd to God. You'll be what you already are right now. His bride his child, his treasure. And you can picture God in heaven. You can picture God walking straight up to you, just, just to you, and wiping, wiping the tears from your eyes. And you can picture God saying to you, saying just to you, you know, I saw every one of those roll down your cheeks because I was always with you. And every single one of them served my gracious purpose for your good to bring you here to me. And then those tears will have served their purpose. And God will wipe away every tear from your eyes for good. Amen.